Hi all, welcome back to chapter four, a rotational view of the atmosphere. Today we'll be discussing part four, which is mountain waves. So we're continuing our series looking at the role of vorticity in the atmosphere. So what is typically observed in the northern hemisphere, especially in the northern latitudes, is the existence of large wave-like features. So these are usually waves which have um, a wavelength of tens of thousands of kilometers um, and stretch over much of the northern hemisphere. The waves look very similar to what is shown in this figure, where we see basically a positive relative vorticity at the trough of the wave and a negative relative vorticity at the crest of the wave and a continued persistence of the wave-like feature as it transitions around the, uh, around the Earth. The main culprit for this turns out to be largely topographically driven forces, and we're going to see why that's the case in this lecture. Consider a very simplified scenario. We have a mountain which exists on the Earth's surface, and we have an impinging flow which is purely zonal and heading in the eastward direction, that is a westerly flow, uh, towards the mountain. Recall the concept of potential vorticity that we discussed last time for our barotropic fluid. For our barotropic, incompressible, and homogeneous fluid, we have that this quantity, potential vorticity, is conserved following a fluid column. Potential vorticity in this case being zeta g, which is the vorticity obtained from the geostrophic wind, plus f, which is the planetary vorticity, all divided by the height of the fluid column h. So the question is then, what can barotropic potential vorticity tell us about flow over a mountain? Well, let's assume that in our simplified scenario, we have a very long mountain. That is, it's uniform in the north-south direction to the degree, and it's sufficiently long that basically fluid parcels are unable to go around the mountain. So consequently, everything has to essentially remain uh, meridionally symmetric. That is, you can't have any significant changes in the north-south direction associated with the flow because there's no mechanism by which those changes can be generated. We're going to assume that there is a particular column depth associated with the flow. So this might be the scale height of the atmosphere or it might be the distance to the tropopause. Um, and we're going to assume that the column depth is defined between adiabatic fluid layers. So we have a particular potential temperature theta located at the surface, and the column depth is located at some distance delta theta up in the atmosphere. Since flow is adiabatic, the fluid will be confined between layers of constant potential temperature, and consequently we can use the uh, construction of potential vorticity in practice in this scenario. We're going to start with a case where the flow is completely zonal. For a completely zonal flow, you can quickly verify that the relative vorticity of the flow is actually equal to zero upwind of the mountain. So there is no, um, there is no initial relative vorticity associated with the flow, but there is a planetary vorticity since this occurs in the mid-latitudes. The column height here will be denoted by capital H. So the question then becomes, what happens when this wind reaches the mountain? How is it modified when the topography is present? Well, we know for one that flow cannot go into the surface. So the flow will act as an obstacle for the wind. Since the wind will be unable to go around the mountain in the north-south direction, the only option is then that the wind will go over the mountaintop. So air must be lifted in this case. The mountain induces vertical velocity in the flow due to the fact that the wind cannot go into the mountain. And since it is roughly incompressible, it cannot compress itself either in order to satisfy the conditions of flow over a mountain. Consequently, there is lifting in the height of the fluid column. It is, not, it is much more spread out, however, compared to the shape of the mountain itself due to the pressure gradient force. So instead what we see in the vicinity of the mountain is this shallow cap which occurs over a large east-west uh, distance uh, covering, the, covering in the range of the mountain. Um, so this basically represents the confines of our fluid column then as it passes over the mountain. 
Notice that the height of the fluid column then increases slightly before it actually reaches the mountain itself. And so by conservation of potential vorticity, if the denominator increases and the planetary vorticity is constant, that is, we see no variation in the latitude associated with the fluid column, then it must follow that the relative vorticity of the fluid column must increase. So what does this mean for the flow then? Suddenly we have a flow that has transitioned now from having zero relative vorticity to a flow which now has a positive relative vorticity. Well, there's a number of possibilities here. So you can plot the types of vorticity that we've examined, namely rotational vorticity and shear vorticity here along the y-axis, and we can plot, plot cyclonic and anticyclonic vorticity along the x-axis. Recall that cyclonic vorticity corresponds to positive vorticity in the northern hemisphere, and anticyclonic vorticity corresponds to negative vorticity in the northern hemisphere. Well, since we know that the vorticity is positive, that means it must be cyclonic. And since we know that the flow must be meridionally symmetric, that is, the, it, there will be no change in the flow in the north-south direction, that eliminates the generation of shear vorticity from the possibilities that will occur when the height of the fluid column ex increases. Consequently, we must conclude then that the fluid column picks up a rotational component. That is, it begins spinning in response to the generation of positive vorticity. So in the northern hemisphere then we have that the flow must turn northward. That is, it turns in a counterclockwise direction in order to satisfy the potential vorticity conservation. If we look at this from above then, here depicting the mountain in the north-south direction and the flow from overhead, we will see that as the flow approaches the mountain to a depth that is larger than the initial depth, the flow must turn northwards in order to compensate for the increase in the column height. Now what happens when the fluid column passes over the mountain? Well, by conservation of potential vorticity, we now have that the height of the fluid column is much smaller than the initial height of the fluid column. Consequently, the relative vorticity, which was initially zero, must now be negative so that the numerator um, is going to be equal to the denominator, so that the ratio is maintained and potential vorticity is conserved. So in the northern hemisphere, when the height of the fluid column decreases then, the flow must take up negative or anticyclonic vorticity and hence will turn southward in order to satisfy potential vorticity conservation. Looking at this from above again, we have an initial northward twist in the fluid column in response to the increase in fluid column height followed by a sudden decrease in uh, the fluid column height leading to the generation of anticyclonic vorticity and hence a southward turn of the fluid column. So what happens then once the fluid column passes over the mountain? Well again we have a scenario where the fluid height is larger than it was initially and so potential vorticity conservation then states that the relative vorticity must become positive and so the flow must again turn northwards in order to re respond to this increase in column height. So from overhead again we see a figure which looks like this. Coming from the far left we have an initial northward turn twist in the fluid followed by a southward dive over the mountain range followed by an again northward twist in the fluid. And when the fluid returns to its original latitudinal location, one observes then that it will actually have a northward velocity associated with it. So what we then see is that the fluid will overshoot its initial position, and hence it must compensate correspondingly. Since f is greater for deflections to the north, that is, in when you go farther north, f increases, it must for the same fluid column height then, you must have that the relative vorticity is negative in order to maintain potential vorticity conservation. Analogously, when the fluid column passes too far south, F is going to be smaller, and hence the relative vorticity will be larger to compensate, leading to a northward twist in the fluid column. The overall result of this is that excess planetary vorticity will then lead to wave-like behavior. And you'll see this persistent wave train then associated with the lee of the mountain. 
where you have a fluid column which trends northwards and then trends southwards again. And it'll continue repeating this due to the uh, instability associated with this, this wave-like feature. So for atmospheric waves, then, we see this in practice quite often. You have a wave-like feature in the atmosphere where you have fluid columns which are moving southward. Because they're moving southward, planetary vorticity decreases, and hence relative vorticity must increase in order to maintain potential vorticity conservation. This means that the fluid will turn northwards, and as it goes farther north, relative vorticity uh, will begin to decrease as planetary vorticity increases. So again, potential vorticity conservation then tells us quite a bit about the behavior of these fluid columns on the large scale. You can see this if you look um, above the Earth's surface, here plotting above the north pole of the Earth, and you can see these large persistent wave-like features. And these are very closely associated with um, mountain-generated wave trains. In particular, if you look in North America, which is in the southern part of this figure, you can see that as the flow passes over the Rocky Mountains, there's initially a northward tendency for the flow, followed by a southward dive as the flow passes over the Rocky Mountains, and then a wave which persists in the lee of the mountains. This is also known as an Alberta clipper. For those of you who live in the Midwest that would be that are quite familiar with this phenomenon, where you see very cold Arctic air basically drawn to the south as a consequence of the diving jet stream in this vicinity. And the reason for the diving jet stream is due to the presence of mountains and a decreased column height, which leads to a southward dive in fluid columns in order to conserve potential vorticity. Now one might ask an analogous question. What happens if fluid flow comes from the east? And I'll leave that as an open question for you to think about for next time.